Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Um, we're on to our second panel today um, talking about climate stories. We have a really incredible group um, that uh, has expertise in storytelling and also getting stories to reach people. And so I'm really, really excited. Um, we've got a kind of a global view on this panel. Um, and so let's start uh, with introductions. Um, and Richie, if you'd kick us off and uh, tell the folks the amazing thing you're premiering here. Um, my name is Richie Mehta. I'm writer, director, executive producer of a series called Poacher, uh, which is on wildlife crime uh, and the wildlife mafia in India and Asia. Uh, and it's a dramatization of a true story of the biggest elephant poaching case in Indian history uh, and basically profiles wildlife crime fighters, people who are on the front lines doing everything they can to essentially save the world. Um, and it's a project I've researched for years and now made an, essentially an eight-hour film out of, and we're premiering the first three episodes here. Go ahead, Poppy. Awesome. Um, I'm Poppy Mason-Watts, Chief Growth and Impact Officer of Water Bear. I sadly don't have a film premiering here, so congrats to you guys, not to me. Um, so Water Bear Network is a free streaming platform dedicated to the future of our planet. We set up in Amsterdam two years ago off the back of a film called My Octopus Teacher, which some of you might have seen. I'm despicably jet-lagged, so apologies if nothing I say makes sense today. I've had about three hours sleep in the last 48 hours. Um, but we'll dive into what Water Bear is about, but mainly we tell stories with impact, and we, we work on impact campaigns and distributing those stories to make as much impact as possible. Hi, I'm Elaine McMillian Sheldon. I don't use the word despicable enough. I'm glad you used it because I'm, I'm going to find a way into that. Um, I am the director of King Cole, a feature that's premiering here in the next section. Um, I live in Tennessee, Knoxville, Tennessee, and I mostly work across Appalachia. I'm from West Virginia, and my film is sort of a magical realism documentary in our post-coal scenario that we're looking at in Appalachia, and I've been telling stories there for over a decade, so happy to be here. And it was Elaine who taught me that Appalachia is the right way to say it. Like, <laughs> if you say it wrong, I'll throw an apple at you. That's the way to <laughs> Um, Elaine, I'd actually really love to start with you. I've, I've, I've followed your career for quite some time now. Um, and you've taken a lot of runs at the story of your home place. And I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about like how your storytelling about the place has evolved and what it is you're really aiming at now. Yeah, it's like... I keep going back to the well and keep finding more heartache and also more resilience. And until I no longer feel that, I'll probably keep going back to that well. I think that, you know, most of us maybe in this room don't really um, identify with a place, um, but I do. And I'm uh, my family's been in that region I'm the ninth generation and have really fought to stay in that region and, and that hasn't always looked good in the way we look at the modern context of our world today. And so for me, it's it's about fighting for place. It's about um, recognizing uh, sometimes destructive uh, past and present and thinking about how we can work in the future. I've tackled the story of um, sort of uh, economic injustice, poverty, environment, all those things through interactive documentaries, through podcasts, through uh, feature films, through short films. And I think that the reason I explore all those mediums is I first find the story, I find the people, they inspire it, and then I figure out what's the best way to tell it and how to, you know, that depends on the audience. Like, how are you going to reach people? So this recent film is the, the first time I've actually used fiction and magical realism to help tell that story because I just think the... The future looks dark <laughs> when we when we just look at it for face value, and I think imagination is part of our solutions, right? Um, and so, reminding people that there is a future that we can dream up and that we can imagine, and that it's not just facing just the facts. I think is something that we need because it's it seems very hard at times to face the future, and um, and involving young people. I think that that's increasingly been becoming a part of my work because I have a kid now. And I have an investment in um, that future in a different way that I didn't have before. I could really listen to her talk about her work all day. That's part of why I'm so excited that she's here. Um, Richie, I'd be really curious. You said you've researched this for a really long time. Um, why was this the story that you really invested in and, and, and your approach to it being a, a fictionalization? Um, what did you want to do with this? Um, I had made a series uh, a few years ago called Delhi Crime, 
which was about a vicious gang rape on a bus in Delhi. Um, and uh, when I was finishing that, I had connected with a wildlife crime fighter in Delhi um, through a very strange circumstance. And I just found the title. When I heard somebody was a wildlife crime fighter, I just thought, well, what the hell? How cool is that? How interesting is that? Um, and so I, I wanted to meet with him, and uh, he, I connected with him, and he was, I was in Delhi finishing Delhi Crime, and he was leaving the next day to go on a six-month un, six undercover operation in Nepal with a uh, smuggling tribe that would traffic animal parts and um, arms and people. And he was going to undercover, undercover with them. So he's like, I'm leaving tomorrow. I can meet you for 10 minutes tonight at midnight in front of a metro station. I said, done, let's do it. So we, I just followed an instinct. I went, I had my laptop with me. We stood outside the metro station on the street. And he said, who are you and what do you want? And I said, this is, what I, this is who I am, this is what I'm up to. I'm just finishing this series on this case which you know about. I showed him a couple of minutes of it. Um, I have, uh, I'm not good at many things in my life, but I'm good at some things. And if I can help you in any way with your fight, I'd like to. And he said, boss, I like you, I, I like, you. I like the vibe of you, let's do this. When I'm back from my operation, we'll meet. I said, anything it takes. So. I just followed the instinct and then I started going back to India to meet with him. He started walking me through this massive elephant ivory case, um, which got into the whole world of, uh, I mean, and you, ha you have tribal people, indigenous people in certain areas who um, struggle to make a living, especially in forests and jungle environments, and then they start poaching. Um, and then you have the dealers who take advantage of them. Um, you have the lawyers who protect those dealers. Um, and then you have the, the, the high level dealers who deal with the buyers who are some of the wealthiest people in the world, who will just pick up the phone and say, I want this. And then it's always, made, it's always poached to order. And then it goes down the line, an elephant's killed. Um, and so I was starting to, to look at this and said, this is like a vertically integrated wildlife mafia, um, which, if it continues, will eventually spell destruction of most species. Um, and as I got to know these people and got to know the world, and I met with some poachers who had turned to conservationists and some people in this case, I met everyone involved in this case, uh, we would meet in the jungle in clandestine locations and stuff. And it was just, just to see their world was so fascinating. And I felt the most, they would never let me record anything they're saying. I was just always taking notes. Um, and I felt the most honest way to, to recreate their story was to do it dramatically. Uh, and it's so elaborate. It goes into so many different aspects of our society, uh, including our relationship with everything, uh, that I felt that it justified seven hours of screen time. Um, and then there were people especially in the United States, I have to say, who are willing to roll the dice on this and say, we'll just finance this on a whim and good luck and we think we can make, a di make an impact. Um, my hope with this is to inspire people to go into wildlife crime fighting, to, for people to understand. I, I try and do it in a non-judgmental way because even the tribal people on the ground, they're, they don't know anything. They come from historical hunting families for 3,000 years and all of a sudden the law changes one day and they don't really know what to do. Um, and so... Uh, I, I try to look at it in a non-judgmental lens. Um, but the fact is, these crime fighters, they are exactly like you and I. They would totally blend, here, blend in here. And they are sacrificing everything in their life to do this. I mean, when, when I say going undercover for six months in Nepal with a, with a tribe, I, I cannot tell you how difficult that would be for any of us. Um, and that's what these people do. And so I just felt it was, it was worth it. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Poppy, I'm, I'm really curious because you're very invested in helping stories like these reach as wide as possible. But, I mean, is, does it stop there? Like, what? <laughs> can, you, can you talk to us? I mean, I think your title is Chief Impact Officer, yeah. right? What yeah. that means, who knows, but yes. <laughs> well, I think, I think you're, you're chiefly invested in the notion of impact. Absolutely. That's how I think yeah. of it. Um, so, um, so, yeah, so I'd like to hear how you think about that when you think about these kinds of stories. Of course. I think what's fascinating about both stories is they are very different formats. So you've got serialization, you've got fiction trying to cut through the echo chamber, and that's exactly what we're doing at Water Bear. Um, so for many of you, maybe you do know, maybe you don't, but Water Bear, we set up kind of two or three years ago, Deepest Darkest Pandemic, and our core mission was how can we use stories as a vehicle to drive change, drive action, drive impact? 
Um, so our platform is small. Um, we've kind of we're, we're hitting the millions now, which is fantastic and very exciting for us. And Sam, who's in the audience, one of the founders. Um, so we're kind of very grateful that it's growing. But what we're trying to do with every single piece of content, whether it's an acquisition, we're licensing content, we're producing content, we're working with epic filmmakers like yourselves, is look at how we can drive the biggest campaign around the piece of content that we're that we're kind of focusing on. So at Water Bear, we look at four different impact quarters, um, and our core focus in each quarter is what is the tangible, measurable impact that we want to generate or drive with that piece of content. So we've just wrapped up a, a kind of major campaign for, I say major, it's major for us, because um, we're obviously only two years old, but a major campaign focusing on the dark side of the fashion industry. Um, and what we wanted to look at was how we can change legislation in the EU around the use of fur and leather in fashion shows. And that filmmaker, she was fantastic because she desperately wanted to drive impact and didn't want to sit as another image on a carousel on Netflix. So she came to us knowing the numbers would be slightly smaller, but that we would get it in the hands of the right people. And we've kind of organised sessions with um, British Fashion Council, Fashion Justice Collective. We've got people in a room using that film to, to drive that narrative. Um, and it's exactly the same. We're doing the same this year. We're, we're looking at an immigration campaign at the moment that we're focusing on. We're launching a major film in a few weeks' time, I say major again, slightly self-deprecatingly for us, it's major, but um, it's coming up and it's super exciting. So with these pieces of content, I think it's it's really cool to be able to tell the story in a very different way because that's how you're going to cut through and, and reach the masses, which essentially is what we're trying to do with our impact campaigns. Yeah. Elena, I'd be curious because you, you've, so, you've been through a lot of cycles of this. I've seen you all over this country. We became friends entirely on the festival circuit. I don't know that we've ever seen each other in our hometowns, <laughs> ever. <laughs> um, uh, but I, I'd be really curious. Like, y You've been doing this a long time. You were making transmedia content when we were calling it that. And any of you were around for the transmedia age? Uh, that was really short, very buzzy <laughs> period, <laughs> about two years long. Now we just call it the internet, I think. Um, <laughs> uh, but you've seen a lot of cycles of this, and it's interesting that your storytelling is also sort of evolving. Um, but how are you thinking differently about like who this reaches and, and what it does to them? Yeah, well, I'm, I made, uh, yeah, I've seen all levels. Like Hollow, which is an interactive documentary I made, is two and a half hours long. It's got 30 short films in it, like user-generated content. Um, you know, if you're tagging something on Instagram, it'll show up in the experience. So it was like, completely different than sitting in a theater, what I'm showing on Monday, um, and having this, you know, sort of pat more passive experience with visceral one. Um, and then I've made films for Netflix and talking about the audience. It's like, it's really tough where, you know, those two films, we were able to carve out educational rights for those two films, which were, were about the opi opioid crisis in um, Appalachia. And those films are used in prisons and schools. And so that was such a stark difference from me peddling my interactive documentary <laughs> literally in my car, like <laughs> driving around like any university that wanted to show it and doing these classroom visits. And now to this where King Cole, you know, was we largely raised it through grants and now have a finance, um, you know, had someone Drexler Films came on to um, finance it. And it's it's been um it's been in interesting to see the industry change. I think we say more and more we value independent, um, but I see more and more focus on um, like having something high profile attached to something quite ordinary. And I am someone who relishes in the mundane and the ordinary. And so it's been a kind of a difficult time to figure out how to make the films about the people I love, who are often people that feel very much out of mainstream consciousness. Um, because there's no celebrity attached. And that's unfortunately the sea we swim in. And so I do feel very grateful for place, places like Sundance um, who do still value the independent films that are here showing that don't have distribution, including mine, and can provide that marketplace. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, I kind of put myself away. I like hold myself away and tell the stories that are most important to me that keep me up at night. And um, I do that kind of quietly and slowly because my process is one where I need to be in the field with the people. Like, I don't, you know, it's not about, you know, being in isolation. And so I live in Appalachia. I go out in the field. I meet the people. I figure out what it is they feel is, you know, not working and working in their communities. And I guess it's, you know, people often ask me when I was coming, covering the opioid crisis, they're like, it's so difficult. Like, how do you look, how do you stare down that or things like poverty? And I think what's interesting with even with climate change, when you get up cl close and personal with the people that are making change, you all of a sudden feel a lot more hope yeah. um, because you actually see the people and the stamina and the resilience and the things that they're doing, the daily effort, which 
quite frankly, like when we're looking at these things, there are no such things as solutions. It's really compromises. So what are we all going to compromise and change in our life to reach a goal, a collective goal? And I think that it gives me hope, and I need to be in the field with those people that give me hope. Um, and so no matter, like, how big of a film I do or what medium it takes place, it's still people-centric, real people that, you know, aren't used to having a camera in their face and require me building trust with them before I ever show up with a camera, right? That's, that's half the work. Um, so, yeah. But this film required a level, level of vulnerability. King Cole, I mean, I narrate it. I've never narrated any of my films. And my grandfather's in it. He's a coal miner. And um, it's a very uh, personal, difficult film that took me years to, I felt very naked <laughs> while making it and didn't want to do it and sort of forced myself to step outside my comfort zone, which gave me so much more appreciation for all the people who've given me their stories over the years. Mm. Um, I felt like I was always very careful with those, but now I feel especially thankful for the vulnerability of people that want to appear in nonfiction um, because what do they really have to earn from it? Um, and that's kind of how I feel as a subject of my own documentary this year. Um, so, yeah. I long, love that. Long answer. No, that was you mean, beautiful. You mean you didn't earn from your nonfiction <laughs> narration work? A <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, Richie, you've spent so much time with these folks also. I'd be really curious, like, how do you think, uh, this is about to have a huge platform, how do you think about the reception of something like this and the people who gave you your stories across the planet? I mean, it, it, you, you said something very eloquent. Uh, they trusted me with their, with their uh, stories. And so the more they trusted me, the more I took it very seriously to, to maintain the integrity of what they said all the way through. Um, and so the, the, the project is based on a bed of promises. You thought I was going to say lies. A bed of promises. <laughs> um, and, I, and, and I've maintained those so far all the way through. Um, so when I, I showed all the real people, the, all eight episodes... Um, two months ago in India, and um, which was really nerve-wracking because you're showing people th at their most vulnerable um, what I, how I interpret it. And their response was, um, they, they, they were very grateful, which was very strange for me to hear. Uh, but then they said that we think this has a chance to stop wildlife crime in India. And I said, how is that possible? And they said, if, the, the, if some of the wealthiest people in the country or in the world, their sons and daughters, who are also very wealthy, are sitting around watching Netflix or, Am or Amazon or Apple, and they watch this. We think they're going to tell their parents, what the fuck are you doing? Why did you order that tusk in our private office? And that's what drives the market. Mm. And so when I heard that, I said, oh my God, this is amazing. Like, this is, this is it. This is what we're trying to go after. And they, and they were saying, Th these are the people we cannot get to because we're on the ground. So the messaging, they're like, if this works, the messaging could, in fact, complement their, their entire mission, mm. if it works. Um, so th that, was, that was the goal of what I set out to do. Um, and as I got to know them when I was researching, all of them are kind of cynical optimists. You know, they all, they all believe that all wildlife will be eradicated at some point. Um, but they believe their work can delay that eradication. And when I hear that, it's, it's a very realistic assessment. They, they, they know Asian elephants will be, ex all elephants will be extinct at some point in our life, and not in our lifetime, maybe in a couple of hundred years. But their work might delay it for 50 years. And I hear that and I say, you know, I have a two-year-old now too. And I would rather be on the side of the people who maybe help to delay that extinction than not. Um, and then on top of that, they, they told me something very interesting. They said, right now, especially in the Western world, we need to figure out a way for the young people to develop memories of the natural world so that they can pass it on to their children. Because if they don't have that sense of nostalgia of the value of the natural, natural world, they will not take it forward. And there's an entire generation, an urban generation that, does, that I belong to that does not have that. So they said that that's what their goal is as well. I take a lot of salt, comfort in knowing that in a million years our son will go supernova and all it's like, hey, you know what, it's all fine. We're just kind of playing, actually. We're just playing around here. But I'd still rather be on the side that dies trying. There are, like, so many T-shirts in, in the last few things that have said. Like, there's... Uh, First of all, like, I want to be on that side or die trying. I want to be on the side of dying trying. Yeah. Something like that. Like, just... 
Uh, and also that there are no solutions, only compromises. Mm -hmm. That's a stolen line. Can you say that? I mean, yeah. <laughs> great. We're going to steal it and spread it to everyone and put it on T-shirts and, yeah. and, I don't know, send him a check. Yeah. Um, uh, what I think is interesting is when I hear about the, the possibilities that these stories hold, we do sit in this complexity of competing for attention, of uh, hits of dopamine from scrolling through TikTok versus sitting with seven or eight hours of content, which is not that people don't do that, right? Like we're binging stuff all the time. Um, sitting with really personal fiction and nonfiction work. Um, and Poppy, what you described is like really sophisticated audience and impact outreach, which is like, you, you can't just, you don't just like whip that up. Um, so I'd be curious about how you're thinking about like the, the pieces that are in place to help like grease the wheels for filmmakers like these. Sure. I think just listening to Richie, what was the most interesting thing you said, obviously everything was interesting, but um, <laughs> <laughs> the one thing that resonated was um, you really think you could make a difference with this film and, and you know, the, the platform you're talking, it, it could stop, stop the poaching. Um, and I was just sitting here wondering, is that being tracked in any way? Is anyone going to put a metric in place that says with this film we are going to stop X percentage of poaching or whatever it might be? And that that is where we're coming at it from. How By the way, I want to talk to you after. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was going to say. Carry, yeah. carry oh, you yeah. think this was an accident? No, no, no. I know what I am doing. <laughs> no, I'm sitting here thinking if you both got distribution, clearly you do. But um, no, what's interesting? We come at it from that. We're we're looking at and I've got lots to say actually. Sorry. Um, so starting there, we. From the impact side of things, we're putting in a framework um, to work with filmmakers so that we can really show that with your film, what you have set out to achieve is X, this is where you're going with it, this is how it's been achieved, whether it's measurement, whether it's setting KPIs before the film launches, and we want to be able to report on that, because I think I used to work at Nat Geo, um, and the filmmakers we worked with, we just didn't share anything. Um, One second. Before KPI I is a key performance indicator. Oh, sorry. It is a metric that you choose to measure. Yes. Uh, we forget sometimes. Sorry, <laughs> it's okay, guys. it's okay. <laughs> Um, so we set we set these metrics ahead of launching a piece of content, essentially. So with the film, the fashion industry film I mentioned, it was all about um, changing behaviours in the next generation of fashion students. So that was a big screening campaign. It was awareness, so that was eyeballs. It was as many people as could possibly see it. In that sense, we didn't mind that we didn't have it exclusively. We had a month exclusivity, exclusivity on Water Bear, and then it went over to Amazon. Um, because we wanted eyeballs, we wanted awareness. And then the third piece was starting a conversation around the legislation piece. piece. I can't speak, that's my jet lag. Despicable. Um, <laughs> so that's, um, that's where we're coming at it from. And I think the metric side, it's fascinating because impact measurement is so early. Um, everyone knows this, but we are really trying to set a standard for how we can work with filmmakers to measure that impact, to measure those eyeballs, and to share that data with you guys so that we can learn from that. Because I think if we're making films and we're blind to the data, we can't learn from, from what's resonating. The other thing, just coming back, is how... You know, we, we talk about the attention economy actually being, being our biggest competitor. It's not the Netflixes or the Amazons or the Disneys. It's social media. It's anything that's striving for attention. Um, and we actually relish that. We embrace it. Let's use TikTok. Let's use Instagram. Let's use as many platforms as possible to spread the word. So we've got... Um, Everything that we do, everything that we work with filmmakers on, everything that we produce or acquire has to have that ancillary content to start breaking down the barriers and the audience groups that we want to get into. Um, and I think that's so key. The other thing is, and then I'll stop talking, apologies, um, is looking at different kind of lengths, formats, things that cut through. So I get laughed at a lot because I come from the general entertainment world and I talk about how can we make documentary content accessible for a me example and it's we've just forayed into animation we've just done an eight minute short animation piece of content on deep sea mining which will talk to a family guy generation um or rick and morty for anyone that's seen that we're also looking at reality series um so dare i say it a green dating show we'll see that how, how that resonates <laughs> um <laughs> sorry sam is looking at me like god good god what she's saying but um we're really no, great, great. Um, but it's really trying, and, and that data again is so key because if we can see that an animation piece of content is resonating with the target audience and making them do something, then we can start making more content like that and, and we can share that with the filmmakers. So that's what we're trying to do. Sorry, that was a very convoluted response. Yeah. As a small side note, one of the, th the things that makes me so happy and proud about being here is that in the description of our series um, on the website, it, the genre is action thriller. And I'm like, 
<laughs> like that, that's what we want it to be. We want people to say, oh, I want to go see an action theater. That's, that's, that's what we're going for. Can I comment on Please. that? Please. It's so relieving to like say fashion students, right? That's such yeah, a slice yeah. that I think as a filmmaker working in this space where there's this competition, it's none of it's real. <laughs> none of it's like you can't reach everyone, right? And so like this pressure to like be everywhere and reach everyone and all that it's so counterproductive for me and the and the goals i have and you know the comparison of some films reaching some audiences it's just like so nice to hear fashion students because like where can you make the measurable impact and we were seeing in the films that made made about the opioid crisis one of the biggest benefits of those was about building empathy and so we saw a huge um, use of those in like nursing and um, in medical school, actually like showing hands-on, or like people who were having hands-on impact with real people, like this is what it looks like for someone to go through recovery for 18 months. This is what it looks like to revive someone from a drug overdose in the field. This is what it looks like to go through drug court. And that, I think that that is still at the center of all the story is empathy, right? And, and commu hopefully in some ways communicating not just a reality on the ground, but a hope for something better, mm -hmm. right? Um, not just depressing people, right? And I think oftentimes we can depress people into inaction and, and really make them overwhelmed. And so the craft of story, the craft of building empathy is, I th just think, well established with a, like a very sliver of a market that will actually be able to make change in the next generation. Um, no, I completely agree. And I think what, what we start with is the audience, who we try to, who we try to target with this, because we talk about the Gen Z audience, which is millions of people as we all know um, and we can't create content that's going to resonate with every single one of them so at Water Bear we say everyone has their thing everyone cares about something and what is it that they care about let's make something that is going to resonate with them so we launched a piece of content re recently about um, how well we started with how do we get football fans into Water Bear how do we encourage football fans to come and engage with climate related content that's that's not easy um, so we created a piece of content on football pitches flooding um, and that brought in a whole new audience. We could see where they came from via the social channels that we pushed it out mm. on. And we could measure that sentiment shift as they kind of journeyed through the platform because it took one piece of content to get them in with a kind of social campaign in the right places. They came into the platform. We then had to focus with two or three more pieces of content before they did something. Or with some, it was such a strong piece of content that they did something immediately because you can take action in our platform while you're watching. Um, and I think it's got to start with the audience and what they care about. And, and if we kind of start with that and that empathetic, what is that nugget that's going to bring them in and tease them, get them, um, and that we go from there. Uh, by the way, what you've just described is like my end goal in life, professionally. Like to, to have a group of people come together in an organization and basically um, delineate this is an issue we want to tackle. What's the best way to do it? Is it a short doc? Is it a is it a social media piece? Is it a feature film? Is it a series? And then do it in a big way. Yeah. That what you're talking about because it's one thing to respond to people's work and distribute mm. in a certain way. It's another thing to commission it. Yeah. And that is literally my end goal. What you guys are up to, and, and it's really I, my hats off to you. Really, yeah. I'm smelling future partnerships here. I don't know about you all, um, Julie. Am I right that we have ten more minutes? Thank you. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I was timekeeping properly. Um, I'm, I'm really curious about kind of how you think about this platform. I mean, we were here at Sundance, right? And um, I think one of the reasons we live stream these panels is like, it's not like this is the most accessible place on the planet. <laughs> we're in Park City, Utah. We're, I don't know, 5,600 feet in altitude. Uh, it's really far away for some of you. It's really, really far away from some of your audiences. It's really out of reach of some of the folks whose stories you're telling. Um, and yet there is, I mean, you all are experiencing the vibe that happens here and the, uh, and the creative connections. But I'd be really curious, like, how do you think about this place, this platform, vis-a-vis -vis specifically the stories that you're telling that are really about the ills of capitalism and, you know, um, long generational sort of commitments and traumas that are really, really hard to exorcise. Um, and yet here we are. Uh, for the folks who aren't here, like if you could imagine in your mind the most uh, pristine, snowy mountain town 
Uh, we've had a dusting of snow the last couple of days. It is sunny. It is sparkly. Like, it we doesn't feel like we're in yeah, a real it's place. It's winter wonderland. Yeah. It is winter wonderland, absolutely. Like, you couldn't illustrate this more perfectly. Um, and yet, we're here tackling really, really challenging material and subjects. And, and there's a complexity of being here. Cost a fuck ton of money to get here and to stay here. We are in a condo uh, on Main Street, which is the main drag in Park City. Um, and uh, it's a, it, was, it was multiple tens of thousands of dollars to have this space and put this on. Um, and it feels like the right investment to make because of who can collect here. And also, it has a lot of layers to it. So I'd just be curious about how you think about this platform. You've been here a lot. No, I haven't been. Is was it Sundance? Wasn't this is my first film here? I thought I was here for fun. No, wait, with the chicken and egg program. Okay. But people come here for fun. <laughs> I had fun. Yeah, where, where did your interactive <laughs> documentary premiere? Where did Hollow premiere? It was like a Tribeca film. I don't remember. Oh, where, I saw where, it at I True don't Falls. Know, went everywhere. True Falls. Sorry, yeah. all the festivals I mean, for bleed me, together after. This is like kind of an amazing place to be because I mean, how many people in this room have been to Appalachia, West Virginia? Okay, like so. I hope that my film transports you to a place you've never been. That you likely have certain beliefs or stereotypes about it, just like we all take shorthand on each other's communities when we don't know them firsthand, right? Like, it's a very human thing. It's not necessarily something we should see as evil. It's just the way we compute one another and our differences, right? And so, like, I'm transporting you to the place I love, and I'm transporting largely an audience that's not been there. And for me, that's really impactful. Yes, it'll be in West Virginia. Yes, it'll be in Appalachia. We will absolutely get it there. Also, this place was built on silver mining, Right, this place in the fifties looked like West Virginia, and there's and a little bit of death here. in the room, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> no, no one that. was here. It was depopulated. The mines closed, and so this place, to me, you know, the opulence is one thing, but it also represents a rebirth, a um, revitalization that you know I hope for my community. Right, we're not going to be Park City, but. This place proves that, you know, an extractive industry that goes under, that people feel so identified with, that people feel, you know, is their identity, is their being, is their only way for making an income, you know, this place sort of represents a really interesting transition um, from that economy. Um, it's obviously a very different scale, right? But, I mean, ultimately, m I love to be here for this film because this is the most, this film, all my films have been important to me, but this is the one that's the closest to my heart. And I'm transporting you to a place that I feel so deeply about. And I hope that in some ways, anybody who walks away from it just has a little bit deeper of a connection about this place and what it's contributed to our society and what we hopefully can give back to the people that I've sacrificed. Um, so it feels very far away, but at the same time, I think that um, it's a very meaningful place it's to, to premiere this. So, and we'll bring it home, you know, we're, you, we, it'll go home right after it's here, you know, to a private screening to everybody c who contributed. So both are important. Mm. Both audiences are needed. Uh, I mean, in my case, it's, it's, this is my second time coming and, and it's really important for me um, to cut through the noise uh, and the curatorial process is crucial right now, I think, for that. Um, you talk about um, attention economy, it's an interesting expression. Um, and in this attention economy, I trust implicitly the opinions of some of the, of the programmers here because they do watch everything and they have very sophisticated tastes. At the same time, they're also trying to be accessible. So just by being here and being selected to be here, you cut through the noise to the handful of gatekeepers in the world who can beam this thing out to the people I said who are my end goal, getting to. Yeah. So it literally is like, it's like the turnpike to get on the, the super highway that I'm trying to get to. And if you don't get on that turnpike, you can't get on the highway. And that turnpike is guarded by curators who I trust implicitly. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones who, if they say, hey, this is great, or this is interesting for us, then that is also a sign of this will cross over to an audience that may not necessarily think about these things. Mm -hmm. um, so that's very, very important for me personally, but also ex extremely important for the end goal of this project. Mm -hmm. So my answer is going to be a little bit different, obviously, because I'm not a filmmaker. Um, it's, it was a bit of a quandary for us because obviously we're a startup. It's incredibly expensive to be here. It's, it was an 11 hour flight, which felt very long. Um, but that's a first world problem, isn't it? I shouldn't be complaining about that. But um, we, it's a bit of a pinch me moment because it's really cool to be here. It's, it's as you've said, a gateway to kind of the filmmakers, the producers, the experts in this industry. And I think 
we have what we call an impact framework internally where we have to measure everything that we're doing. So if we're going to fly across the world, we need to make sure it counts on every single level. So we're going from here to investor meetings to New York to meet with Tribeca. We're doing a heap of stuff this trip and we do one trip every quarter because we just can't again, as a startup, can't necessarily afford it, but also have to make it count. Um, but then it has counted. Just arriving yesterday, went to a party, fed by Blue, I think it was, and we met seven or eight people that we've wanted to meet for such a long time, wouldn't be able to meet because they're based over here. Calls happen and they happen so much, things happen so much slower across virtual. Um, so there's power in, power in people, I guess, and power in being here in, in the physical. Um, but that's not to say it comes without costs and yeah. everything else. Yeah, I, I remember when I was thinking about starting Seed and Spark. Um, this was the most Hollywood moment it, it, of my entire life, and it happened like 11 years ago when I, it was Seed and Spark was a sort of nascent idea. At the, ti at the time, it was actually still called the Independent Media Wish List, which is not a good name for a website. Um, <clears throat> I would discover before launching, thank goodness. Um, but uh, this this sort of advisor, uh, sort of self-appointed advisor of mine, sort of, I'm going to take you under my wing. And I was like, cool, I didn't ask for that, but I appreciate you. Um, but I remember he said to me, like, if you want to be a player, you got to go where the players are. And, and I was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to try to translate that into something that makes sense for me. Um, but he, but he convinced me to come to Sundance and I put it on my credit cards, uh, in 2012. And it, it prompted me to get a wireframe of a website together that I went and took around to all the filmmakers who had funded on Kickstarter, that 16 films had funded on Kickstarter that year. This was 2012. Um, and uh, I just talked to people and they were willing to talk to me and they were willing to tell me what they needed. And it, I left here like, okay, there's a thing that we should build. Yeah. And there's a community that is that we could be in service of. And so I do think these gathering places are really, really essential. And there are lots of them. Like Sundance is not the only place to do this. You have the Atlanta Film Festival. There are incredible film festivals in the Southeast. Um, I think of True False as like the great under the radar. It's a documentary film festival in Columbia, Missouri. It's the best time you'll ever have. It's like magic. Um, there are f festivals all over the country and all over the world where this thing that we're doing here is really possible for you. Um, and so find the one that's close to you, wherever you are at home. Um, and we're, we're really honored to be here. And I just want to thank these panelists so incredibly much. Um, Elaine's film premieres 1130 on Monday. And Richie, where, where are you in uh, your cycle? We are, uh, we're having a Park City premiere um, on the 24th at 2.20 p.m. Okay, yes. on the 24th at 2.20 p.m. Yes. So if you're here, now you know they're probably already sold out, but you can try. <laughs> Get on the wait list. <laughs> um, and thank you all so, so very much, and thank you. And we'll be back in um, for the uh, home audiences in 10 minutes, but we need to be back here and settled in five. All right, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.